everybody, it's Annabelle and welcome back to my channel. In today's video we're going to be doing a repotting session for the rest of the orchids from the haul that I did back in July. So this is also going to include a two month update. I did a video like this previously with a one month update that I will link up in the corner here. First of all we're going to start off with the Renanthera monachica. Now the monachica is a really cute little kind of miniature, quite compact Renanthera. Um, it doesn't attain a massive size width-wise, although it will grow pretty indefinitely vertically. I'm not sure how far away this size is from flowering. What I've received, I think, is a top cutting or a cakey. Um, it has a couple of roots. They're not very good. It has a few branching root tips. They are blackened. I'm not massively hopeful about their transition to semi-hydro, but we do have new roots coming along the way. I'm going to be placing this into a self-watering system in a suitably sized pot. It's an 11 centimeter pot and an outer mask that I've kind of repurposed from a Lidl Phalaenopsis, I think. Um, they came with the free masks and they're actually really great. So it's very bright, but you know, it's cheerful and appropriately sized for the little pot that I've got. So I'm just going to thread a microfiber wick through the bottom of the pot. This pot doesn't have any extra aeration or ventilation holes. Self-watering systems are a little bit airier than semi-hydro if you just think about the wicking efficiency and having a reservoir of water contained within the pot versus below the pot. Um, just there's very, very subtle distinctions, but not enough that they're separate growing methods. They're the same thing, basically. Uh, a lot of people ask me the differences between semi-hydro and self-watering. They're basically the same. There's not enough differences to split hairs over, I think. Um, I do distinguish between the two mainly by reservoir size. So in a self-watering pot, we're gonna have a larger volume of water that you can have at the bottom because you've not got lecker in that reservoir. Whereas in a semi-hydro pot, there's less volume of water you can put in because the lecker is displacing the water. So I'm just going to mix up a little mix for this guy. I'm going to use a mixture of Ceramis, uh, Lava Rock and lecker for these repots. And to start off with, I'm just going to pop some lecker into the base of the pot and check that the orchid fits appropriately. I'm quite happy with that positioning. So I'm just going to then fill around. It's got two roots. I think they're going to be enough to anchor it because of the way that first root is coming down from the stem. I don't think they're going to survive. Um, I'm just going to layer in some lava rock now as well. And lava rock is a bit more moisture retentive, should hopefully help to combat any dry layer issues. And vendacious types seem to really enjoy lava rock. I guess it has a higher porosity in the medium, so as it begins to dry, I guess it has more air pockets that open up potentially. Not totally sure um, as to the reason, but. Bandacious types seem to really like lava rock in their mixes, um, even though it holds more water, so it also seems to hold more air, I think. I'm just going to pop a top layer of lava rock on here, and we're going to see with these, and uh, what I've been doing for this series of repots is to put lava on the top and see if that is enough for each type of orchid to mitigate the dry top layer. In the previous two repots that I showed with the one month update, it wasn't, but we're going to see. It may well be for a Renanthera. Um, because vandas don't really have dry layer issues, honestly. Um, they're kind of the opposite, where they want a lot of aeration and ventilation. So, that is my repot of my Renanthera monachica. Overall, I think we're in a fairly good place. I don't think that those two branching tips on that old, dodgy looking root that's a little bit mushy are going to survive. I'm going to leave everything on though. It's got two roots, that's not a lot. It's got one new root coming. And they will help to give the orchid energy and nutrients, I should say, rather than energy, and water um, while it's adapting. So the timestamp for the update is up in the corner and we will update in this video to keep everything kind of contained and show you the transition process. Next up, we're gonna repot my Aerides falcata. This one is one they've been wanting for a while. It looks very similar to the Hallucciana. However, it's a paler, kind of creamy beige flower, slightly pink, um, rather than the yellows and pinks that you get with a Hallucciana. All of these came in various mixes that included charcoal, and the Aerides falcata and the Rhynchus stylus celestis were potted entirely in charcoal. So, um, they actually have done really great, and they have really great root systems. And I've never come across charcoal before. I have read a lot about it. Um, and I am very interested to try it out because it's been treated in such a way that it's basically inorganic at this point, um, in that hardwood charcoal can be stable for 
a long, long time, um, many, many years. I've seen reference to hundreds of years. I'm not totally sure about that, so I don't want to put that out there. But when I was researching a local um, charcoal company, Dorset Charcoals, that do horticultural charcoals and activated charcoals, um, activated charcoal has been treated to give it a higher surface area and more porosity. Um, so it's got the same elements as charcoal, but amplified, I guess, in the ability to kind of suck in toxic products um, and retain them, but also nutrients um, and water. And that kind of interested me because the porosity element is something we talk a lot about with inorganic materials in wicking setups and the porosity and the ability to wick water is really what kind of determines how much of a dry top layer you're going to get, how wet the environment is with the, the pot, the air ratio. So I actually really want to try some charcoal at some point. I am not going to do it at the moment because we've just moved house and I don't really want to be putting money into lots more um, experiments and tests when I've got lots on the go at the moment. But I will definitely do something with charcoal in the future because I don't have issues with bark. Um, it's not for me. I don't enjoy working with bark. Um, just the properties it has in the environments that I've grown in don't sit intuitively with me with how I am as a grower um, also the fact that with bark and moss you need to do either a one year or two year repot really unless it's orchiata bark we can go a bit longer and that's what I used to use when I used to use bark I used to use orchiata which has been treated to kind of make it more like an inorganic material um, so I will try to out charcoal at some point. It is sticking to the roots like bark, but as I mentioned in the last repot video, I just gently pinch my um, finger and thumb nails in between the media and the root to gently remove the media without damaging the roots at all. And if there is any in here that is attached to a root tip that looks like the root tip would break if I try to remove it, I'm just gonna leave it on. There is absolutely no point in me forcing charcoal off a root tip, breaking the root tip, affecting the ability of the plant to adapt, when pros and cons, that little bit of charcoal in the pot isn't really going to do much, especially since it's charcoal and pretty inert. If it was bark, it'd decompose, probably eventually flush out or we'll get it at the next repot. So in the grand scheme of things, a little bit left on a root tip, the root tip is going to be of more benefit to you than the negatives associated with leaving that little bit on. So. Uh, I always just say, if you really can't get a piece of media off, just don't worry about it, don't stress about it, get it at the next repot. But at the same time, the root system needs to be as clean as you can possibly get it before going into semi-hydro or a constantly moist inorganic system because any organic material left on there is going to rot. This doesn't really apply for charcoal, I think, though. Um, but I am taking it off because I'm repotting it into a media of my choice and I don't want the pot to be mostly charcoal um, that's old, I don't know how old it is, I don't know the properties yet, so I'd rather test that in a controlled way. So all of the media has been removed from the root system, just washed it off at the tap and yeah, pretty much clean. This charcoal has stained the roots a bit but that's nothing to worry about, no damage to the roots themselves. So I'm going to pop this again into a self-watering pot. I have actually got extra ventilation holes in this pot which wasn't when I used to use these as normal pots, these are reused. Um, however, this is actually a bonus for many vandacious species and probably Phalaenopsis as well. Depending on your environment and the extent to which you ex suffer with a dry top layer, um, with the pebbles in my arsenal, which I'm not using on these repots, but with them I have pretty much troubleshooted the dry top layer for me and my climate. So I'm playing around with being able to add more oxygen and gas exchange around the root zone, which is particularly beneficial with thicker rooted orchids, i found. So um, it's kind of very heavily to do with your environment. And if you've got a very dry environment, extra ventilation holes in the pot is gonna mean that your pot is gonna dry out a lot and that may reduce the efficiency of a wicking system or a self-watering system. You may get really bad dry layers that roots can't penetrate. So just always um, use anything like this with caution with your environment and how you observe materials act in pots in your climate because there are so many different factors. So I'm using with this orchid a mix of lecker, pumice, lava rock, 
and a little bit of large grade ceramics mixed in. This is a mix that's coarse and airy, um, but it's going to be very moisture retentive still. And for me, Aerides are just absolute water hogs. They're very distinct from Vanders. Um, they really love a lot of moisture and you can kind of almost treat them more like a Phalaenopsis, honestly. Um, if anything, maybe they like even more moisture. Um, I've got one growing almost in pure ceramics it, with some synthic in it. Absolutely loves it, the Odorata. So um, they are just um, absolute warthogs and very easy to grow and very fast growing. So I definitely recommend Aerides for if you're new to foundations types and want something that's fast growing and easy to pot, basically. Whether you're in inorganic or organic media, uh, I think Aerides are really great orchids. They're a little bit underrated. So I would definitely encourage if you're looking to get Vanders, maybe try Aerides first. Then at the end of this video, we're going to update on this Aerides Falcata, which I'll pop a timestamp for up in the corner here. Um, but again, I'm not going to put pebbles on for now. I've left room to do so if I need to. I'm just going to see how the dry layer affects this orchid um, with the new mixture of materials that I'm using in my new environment. So that's the Aerides Falcata, all repotted. Really great root system on that. I have no doubt at all that this one will take off like the rest of the Aerides. Next up, we're going to be doing my Angrecum calceolus, which has wonderful sprays of little tiny green flowers, which are not fragrant, unfortunately. Apparently, it's not uncommon for up to 10% of the flowers to self-pollinate because they're a very closed, small flower. So we'll see uh, if these spikes progress and whether that happens or not. So this is in a mixture of small grade charcoal and sphagnum moss. It should be quite easy to remove from the roots. So I'm just gonna brush the roots through to try and remove it. And then once I've removed the big clumps, we'll try and kind of focus in on any that's really stuck to the root system. These have all been soaking for a few hours in a nutrient and seaweed mix, which includes rain mix, which is a complete balanced NPK plus calcium plus magnesium. And the calcium and magnesium in it are actually higher than are in the available CalMags in the UK. So I do prefer to use that. Um, calcium and magnesium, they can. Um, have nutrient competition so if possible it's better to feed them on their own um, in a optimized ratio um, but unfortunately I just don't have any good CalMags available that are as good a quality as the calcium and magnesium in this so I use Rain Mix and I'm feeding this at a fairly neutral pH because calcium and magnesium are absorbed at a more kind of neutral pH rather than acidic so you don't want to acidify them too much um, which may limit their absorption. So I've cleaned off the root system, soaked it up and washed it off at the tap and there's a few bits of charcoal left on, little fine grade charcoal pieces and I'm not going to try removing them because these roots are actually quite fragile um, and I don't want to snap any. I've got a good root system here. Just placing it in the pot to check the pot size is appropriate, which I feel it is. And then what I'll do is remove the orchid and actually place some of the mix in. Up to the reservoir holes is filled in with just lecker and then I'm going to add this mix of lecker, large grade ceramics, lava rock and pumice in which is a quite a moisture retentive mix and grecums and angrecoids do really like quite a lot of moisture and they aren't to me typical vanda culture although you will see a lot of guidelines saying to treat them like vandas and to me renanthera and angrecoids are more moisture loving um, there may be exceptions with certain species, but in general, I would say that they probably like a lot more moisture. You can achieve this by changing the potting mix. They may be more suited to potting than basketing. Or if you want to grow them mounted or basketed, they would probably love that. But you'll just maybe, to keep up with them, need to water them more frequently, which for me is a bit of a limiting factor with what I'm available to do. So I prefer to grow things like this potted, and I've actually, my all of my vanders are grown potted just because that's all I'm available to water in that way I can't really have too many things that I'm watering more than every few days it becomes very difficult for me to keep up with so I ultimately tailor my setup around what I'm capable of doing and how I'm capable of keeping up with them because at the end of the day that's going to provide the best care for them that I can in my environment if I'm trying to overachieve and overstretch and um, then ultimately I'll probably fail the orchids if growing lots of orchids mounted for example I would probably struggle to keep up with that so I choose not to. Of course you'll need to adapt what you're doing to the orchid in question um, but I don't believe that that needs to necessarily limit you to 
one way of growing. I think there are so many ways you can grow and I'm, I'm not saying that this is the right way, but it's a way that I'm finding is working for me well at this point and I'm open to change in the future, but I think we can only go with what's working for us at one moment in time, assess the results, see how it does long term, are we still happy with it? Are we continuing with this method? For me, I am still happy with this method. I'm constantly changing and evolving over time and I'm including all these different materials now, which I really think has opened up lots of different ways of growing to me. Um, so I'm actually very grateful for having started YouTube and started trying to experiment with different medias. And I would encourage everybody to do the same, honestly, because I think that that has really helped me to understand the limits of growing orchids and what orchids will enjoy and what they will just tolerate and it's moving away from what they'll tolerate to what is optimal for them in my climate and that may vary and be different to what's optimal in your climate so that is my angrecum calceolus all repotted as you saw it's got actually quite fine roots compared to a typical vanda so this could indicate that it's evolved to like a bit more moisture which is certainly something i've found with other angrecoids again timestamp in the lower corner for anyone who wants to skip straight on to the update and that is the repot stand for these three orchids today and the updates are coming up next so first of all i wanted to um, do an intermediate update with you all so this is a final kind of view of them at the stage of repotting and then we're going to skip ahead a little bit so about four weeks after repotting i discovered a lot of fuzz and mealybugs with these orchids. These were a fantastic haul of orchids from the French eBay seller and I'll link that unboxing in the corner. I was super happy with these and I still am and mealybugs are the lesser of all bug evils however we want to get rid of them so as the leaves have been growing out uh, fuzz has become apparent and this just wasn't noticeable at all at the time of repot um, but it's become apparent for all of them they do have them so first of all what I'm going to do is spray with a systemic insecticide and I'm doing this because I've also been told by somebody else that they found some scale on um, some plants from the cellar so because these have grown out from the leaf joints and I'm only now noticing the mealybugs now that the plants are growing and the leaf joints are kind of revealing their nests and some of the mealybugs are coming out to feed on the flowers of the Angrecum calceolus, I just want to spray a systemic on them all just so that I've got peace of mind. And this will continue to work for um, a week or so while anything that I miss with my second treatment is coming out and biting. So my second treatment is going to be a topical spray of isopropyl alcohol on any nests and bugs I find on flower spikes, but this won't get any eggs or anything. So the systemic is really to future proof this treatment. And then I'll come back in a couple of weeks and see um, how this is going and whether any are becoming evident or whether I got them all by killing the adults with the isopropyl and then um, any eggs that hatch out being killed by the systemic that I've applied. Mealybugs are very easy to kill with some isopropyl alcohol sprays. Unfortunately, the systemic doesn't seem to kill them on contact, which it says that it is a contact and systemic insecticide, but I still had to zap these guys with a second spray of isopropyl alcohol. And I love mealybugs because they show you they're dead by browning when you spray them with alcohol, as the um, fuzzy kind of waxy coat dissolves on them, basically. The alcohol is dissolving that. And now we're going to skip ahead to do a two month update on how the plants are adapting and converting to semi-hydro. So we're gonna do an update on the three from the repots here. I've broken these all up into sections. So, and these are my kind of vandaceous updates. So the Renanthera, the Angrecum, and the Aerides. At a two month update point, this gives us the ability to assess within one video the change and the adaptation process, which I think is actually very helpful to record if I can. Um, and I won't always be able to do this, but I will try and do this when I can. So, first of all, we're going to focus on the Renanthera monachica. My Renanthera monachica has adapted fantastically to the setup. I did actually have to go in and add a pebble top layer. No new root tips were desiccating, but I had to do it for the other two, so I decided to just do it for the Renanthera. We actually have two new roots that have emerged and gone down into the medium, but that old root that it had has died off. You can see that there's some mold growing on it as it decomposes. Um, we did think at the time it was potentially not the best condition. It looked half dead anyway. It just had a couple of branching root tips to show that it wasn't. But these two new roots have got down. They have directed themselves into the medium 
and one of them is just starting to get into the more moist layer and it's developing little fuzzy areas on the root tip as it hits the moisture. It's quite funny to watch. I noticed this also with my Phalaenopsis chilleriana that it developed root fuzz when it got near moisture, like it was really trying to grab on to all the moisture it could get. Um, the roots themselves are very bumpy and knobbly of the Renanthera monochica, but they do seem to be enjoying getting down into the medium. Initial results, they haven't died off, they haven't shrunk their root tips, they haven't stopped growing. So I believe that they are enjoying this potting mix and time will tell as they get further down um, how they do. I am going to leave this dead root on, it may still be functioning in some capacity and when I next repot I will address that and remove it. But for now it is adapting very well with two healthy new roots going down into the media. Now we're going to look at my Angrecum calceolus. This Angrecum flowered for me and I will pop that video up in the corner and it did indeed self-pollinate so two of its flowers self-pollinated and we have seed pods. So um, Angrecum calceolus, baby's coming. We have lots of new root tips emerging from the stem and the existing root system did not die off and is in fact branching further up on the roots. Lots of new root tips coming down that haven't hit the medium yet but the roots inside the medium have survived and not branched massively but they all seem to be doing very well. I didn't put too many up against the side of the pot when I repotted so it's difficult for me to track the existing root system but just from looking at them at the top I can see that they're doing well and the fact that they're branching. They seem to be enjoying the media and um, the orchid's very healthy and is growing very well so I am very happy with how the Angrecum calceolus is doing. It seems to be a very easy orchid to grow and I would recommend this for beginners with Angrecums if you want an Angrecum that's quite forgiving, easy going and you like green flowers I think this is a great candidate for you. Next we're going to update on the Aerides falcata and I, you know I love Aerides and this one has proved to be no exception to that rule. It's very fast growing. It does look um, shorter because I had to add a pebble top layer to this so I filled up that space in the pot but it has grown quite well and it has new root tips coming out of the stem and approaching the medium. Within the medium we actually got huge amounts of live roots. The old roots haven't died off and in fact they have branched, I've got lots of new root tips in the pot and they've just done exceptionally well, branched away, lots of new active root tips growing. So I'm very happy with how this has adapted, pretty much no adaptation or transplant shock. Um, it's just kind of dived in and kept going, kept branching the roots, kept the existing root system. And this could also be to do with the fact that the existing root system was grown in charcoal, um, as well as the contribution that the Aerides makes to how well it transitions. I just love Aerides, though. I've not had an Aerides that, that I've met that I didn't love. Um, but the charcoal seems to be a very moisture retentive medium almost I would say. I had a Rhynchus stylus gigantea that I got in charcoal that took straight off in semi-hydro also so there could be something there. Obviously the environment that the old roots adapt in can definitely influence the success of how they do in the new environment if it's similar or drastically different and one thing you can do if you know an orchid has been kept very dry and adapted its old root system to a very dry environment is you can ease off on the watering for the new environment until new roots get down into there um, and keep it a little bit drier and that might help you to keep that existing root system a little bit longer while those new root tips get down. But obviously try and always repot if you're changing the media dramatically at a time when the orchid is actively growing and producing new roots. I'm very happy with how these three have all transitioned into semi-hydro and I hope that you've enjoyed this video and watching the transition process. These guys are doing great and I'm really happy with them and I can't tell you how much joy it gives me watching new orchids adapt, put new roots down and thrive in a new environment because ultimately we all just want to see our orchids growing and doing well. Thank you so much for watching my video today and I do hope that you enjoyed this video. If you haven't seen part one where I repotted the two Prostechia insiclia hybrids then I recommend checking that video out for a more comprehensive detailed repot and transition with a one month update if you're interested in seeing that type of orchid adapting to semi-hydro and tips and tricks that I used for them and thank you so so much for watching my video today. If you enjoyed this video then don't forget to give it a thumbs up or subscribe to my channel for more regular orchid updates and I'll see you guys all later. Bye!